So in our passage, we are at the climax of the Feast of Booths, sometimes called the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a massive feast. It's happening in Jerusalem. Thousands, tens of thousands of Jews would have been in Jerusalem gathering there according to the law. Seven day long feast. We're at the final day, the seventh day. And there is this water pitcher ceremony that we talked about last week, where every single day the, the priests would go down to the pool of Siloam with this, these golden pitchers and they would uh, dip it in there and take the water and journey back up to the, the temple uh, courtyards. And then they pour the water out on the burnt altar. And uh, this would be, they would be celebrating God's salvation through this act. And they were also anticipating God's promise of a future pouring out of the Holy Spirit. Well, at this time, on the great day, on this last day, sometime around when the priests had done the climactic water pouring ceremony coming to a close, this man stands up in the temple courtyards and proclaims with a loud voice, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying the life and the salvation, the pouring out of the spirit that you are looking for, that you're anticipating for, is found in me. He's saying, I am the fulfillment of the feast of tabernacles. Come to me, believe in me, and you will have life in yourself. You'll have these rivers of living water within yourself. This is one of the most amazing, uh, hope-filled, uh, stunning declarations in all of Scripture. Well, what's the response from the crowd? The response from the crowd is division. It's division. Verse 40 says, when they hear, heard these words, some of the people said, and then you get particular responses from the people, but look how uh, John sums it up. Verse 43, so there was division among the people over him. Division. The Greek word there is schisma, from which we get our word schism. When Jesus proclaims the good news, what happens is there's a rift. There's a schism between the people that are hearing. The gospel brings division. Now, it's true that among believers, the gospel is what unites us. It's what draws us together. It's what knits our hearts together. As Paul says in Ephesians 4, he says, speaking to believers, he says, there is one body and one spirit. There is one hope to which you've been called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Those are all the truths or the fruit that comes from the gospel. So the gospel for us as believers, it unites us. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter uh, what your age is. Uh, it doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter what your gifting is. It doesn't matter if you're male or female. The gospel is what unites us as believers. But when the gospel is proclaimed to the world, it brings sharp division. People who are once in harmony with one another become quickly at odds with one another. And that's exactly what our Lord promised in the passage that Bob read. Matthew 20, uh, 10, 34 through 36 says, this is Jesus speaking, Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the world. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his very household. The gospel divides, even among the closest bonds, which is our family. As the gospel is preached, the result is going to be, it's going to bring some to faith in Christ, but others, their hearts are going to be even more hardened to Christ. And so there will be a divide between those who come to faith in Christ and those who reject Christ. And in our passage, we see this division played out, fleshed out. We see responses from a number of different people. There's five, uh, five different groups of people, and they all have a different response. But there's division amongst them. So what I want to do is I want to look at these five groups, these five responses, and then we're going to close with a couple truths about how these responses teach us in our following of Christ. What, what can we learn in our following of Christ from this division that happens. So here's the first group. The first group has respect towards Jesus, but they lack true faith. Verse 40 says, when they heard these words, 
some of the people said, this really is the Christ. Pardon me, this really is the prophet. So notice that they identify him not simply as a prophet, but they identify him as the prophet. Does that sound familiar? We've heard this quite a few times in John, haven't we? He is the prophet. When, when you've seen uh, the phrase, the prophet in the New Testament, what that's referring to is the prophet, like Moses, who has promised to come, who would arise from within Israel and who would speak the very words of God. God gave this promise in Deuteronomy 18.18 18, through Moses. If you want to turn there, Deuteronomy 18.18 18 says, And I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So I think what's going on here in John is the, the crowd sees Jesus acting like Moses. Moses, through striking the rock, there had been water that had gushed forth, and he provided that for the people of God. And here you see this man standing up, declaring with a loud voice, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. If he believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So they see Jesus going to provide streams of living water. And they, they say, surely this must be the prophet like Moses, the prophet that Moses had predicted. Now, it's true. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the one that was foretold there. He's the one who arises from Israel. He's the one who speaks the very words of God because he is the son of God. But this identification here by the crowd it's inadequate. It's inadequate. That might surprise you. It's a true identification, but it's an inadequate identification. Now, why is it an inadequate identification? It's inadequate because they made a distinction between the prophet and the Christ. For them, the prophet was not the Messiah, was not the Christ, but was simply a forerunner to the Christ. You can kind of see it in our in our passage here, there's a distinction in John 7 between the prophet and the Christ. But you can also hear it in John chapter 1 when, uh, when there's men that was sent to John the Baptist to find out who is this guy? Who is this guy in the wilderness that, that's preaching, that's clothed in camel skins, that's preaching with such authority? And so they ask him in John chapter 1, John chapter 1, 19. And what we read there is John confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not. Then they asked, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And there again, you see a distinction, don't you, between the Christ and the prophet. In the mind of the Jews, the, the Christ or the Messiah was different than the prophet, even though they both are fulfilled in Christ. So these people here in verse 40 in John chapter 7, they had a reverence for towards Jesus. They had a respect of Jesus. They had a high view of Jesus, but they lacked true faith in Jesus. They don't see who Jesus truly is. They don't see him as being the son of God, the promised Messiah. Their, their attitude of respect here, it's not unlike Nicodemus in John chapter 3, when Nicodemus goes to our Lord at night and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Calls him rabbi, calls him a teacher sent from God, and says, you're doing signs sent from God. That's a respect towards Jesus. That's a high view towards Jesus. But what does Jesus say? He says, you need to be born again. You need to be born again. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What Jesus demands of us is not merely respect him, respect towards him. It's not simply that we hold him in higher regard than most, but it's that we see him for who he truly is and that we put our faith in him. It's not enough to say, as Muslims do, that Jesus is one of the greatest prophets. It's not enough to say, as Mormonism teaches, that Jesus is the firstborn spirit child of Heavenly Father who progressed to deity. It's not enough to say, as Jehovah Witnesses teach, 
that Jesus is the first created being and is a lesser, though a mighty God. It's not enough to say that because that's not who he is. Jesus is the eternal son of God. He is co-equal with the father. He's the one who proceeds from the bosom of the father. He's the one who reveals to us who the father is. He's the promised Messiah. He's the lamb of God who is slain on behalf of sin, who takes away the sin of the world. This is who Jesus is. And unless we see him for who he is, it doesn't matter how much respect we have towards him. We do not have true faith. So that's the first group. The second group is they have a true confession of faith. True confession of faith. Verse 41, it's very brief. But others said, this is the Christ. And this is a, this is a true confession of faith from these in the crowd. They don't merely respect him as the prophet. They believe that he is the Christ. And remember that the Christ is another word for Messiah. He's the promised Messiah. And, and this is the whole aim of the book of John. John 20, verse 31, we've been to this passage a lot. These things are written to you so that you may believe that Jesus is the what? The Christ, the Son of the living God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Now, it, it, it's hard for us to grasp the significance of Jesus being the Christ because we so often connect Jesus with the title Christ. Sometimes we even think of Christ as being Jesus' last name, Jesus Christ. But we need to rem remember that the Christ or the Messiah is an office. It, it's a person prophesied repeatedly in the Old Testament, and Jesus fulfills all those predictions. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the Christ? When you say Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Christ, what does that mean? Well, we need to go to the Old Testament to find out what the predictions are, and that helps us understand what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. So let me share with you six passages here from the Old Testament. What it means for Jesus to be the Christ means that he is the son of David who will reign forever as the king. He's the son of David who will reign forever as the king. God gave the promise to David in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He's the son of David. He's a king, and he'll reign forever. It means also that the Spirit of God will rest upon him in fullness. Isaiah 11, 1 through 2 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Before I continue on there, who's Jesse? It's the father of David. The shoot from the stump of Jesse. Again, we see this connection with, this is the son of David. The Christ is the son of David. Isaiah continues, And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And this is what we saw in the baptism of Jesus, that the spirit descended upon Christ in the form of a dove, and rest upon Jesus in all of his fullness. For Jesus to be the Christ means that God will grant the nations to him as a gift. So his kingdom is not going to be only over ethnic Israel. It's going to be a global kingdom. Psalm 2, 7 through 8. And I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I'll make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Because of Christ's faithfulness, God the Father says to the Son, ask of me, and I'll give the nations to you as your heritage. And I, I've heard it said before, it's a great way of putting it, do you think our Lord, when he ascended on high after Ben victorious, do you think our Lord forgot to ask? <laughs> he asked, and God the Father has granted the nations to him as his heritage. For Jesus to be the Christ means that he will draw many nations to himself and will be the source of salvation for them. Isaiah eleven ten. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. And brothers and sisters, we are here as a fulfillment of that. As Gentiles, we have inquired of this root of Jesse. It also means, amazingly, that the son of David 
will be God himself. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor El Gabor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The Son of David will be also God. It also means for Jesus to be the Christ, that he's the suffering servant who lays down his life for his people. Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, chastisement that brought us peace. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. So what does it mean when we say Jesus, the Messiah, that he is the Christ? It means what those passages say. He's the son of David. He's the promised king who is to come. His kingdom will be ever increasing. It'll never come to an end. Salvation is found in him. It's a kingdom of righteousness. He's God himself, and he lays down his life for sinners. He is the Christ. He is the Christ. Well, the third group, the third group has right doctrine, but they're prevented by their ignorance. This is 41 through 44. So this group objects to Jesus being called the Christ. Verse 42, it says, but, but others said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? Now, the crowd's correct here, aren't they? The Christ does come from the offspring of David. He does come from Bethlehem. That's what the scriptures foretold. But they totally miss Christ because of their lazy ignorance. All they had to do was search. They could have asked Jesus. He's right there. They could have said, uh, they could have said, do you have, does your ancestor, ancestral line, does it go back to David? They could have said, we know that you uh, lived in Nazareth, but is that where you were born? Or were you by chance born in Bethlehem? But they don't ask Jesus. They don't ask his half-brothers who are there. Uh, Mary is very likely there. They don't ask her. They have right doctrine here, but they're too lazy to search after Christ. They don't give Jesus careful investigation, and so they dismiss him. Their thinking here is not unlike Nathaniel's original thinking in John chapter 1. When Nathaniel heard of Jesus of Nazareth, his objection was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then Philip said, come and see. Come and see, Nathaniel. Come and see. Don't reject him outright. Come and see. And Nathaniel went and saw, he investigated, and he found out that Jesus was indeed the Christ. Nathaniel's response is the exact opposite of the response of this crowd here. They refuse to come and see. So this crowd here has exactly the right theology. The Christ is from the line of David. The Christ is from Bethlehem. But right theology by itself does not save. Their ignorance prejudices them against Christ, and their own laziness keeps them from searching after Christ. This is not unlike someone who has an understanding of God's word, but who refuses to really dig into God's word and search for themselves, or who doesn't listen carefully to the word of God, or who doesn't cry out to God, God, reveal yourself to me. If we're not careful in searching after Christ, what we'll find is that we'll miss Christ altogether. The fourth group is amazed at Christ, but they're still opposed to Christ. They're amazed at Christ, but they're still opposed to Christ. Now, this fourth group, we left off last week. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the chief priests, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, they were becoming incensed. The people were confessing that Jesus is the Christ. And so they make an official summons to send the temple guard to go and arrest Jesus. You remember last week, there's no resolution to that. These guards are sent, but what's happened to Jesus? Well, here we find the resolution. Look at verse 44. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers, that's the temple guard, then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? And the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. They are crippled, they're paralyzed, 
by the authority and the power and the majesty of Jesus' words. They heard him say, in verse 33, I will be with you a little longer, and then I'm going to him who sent me. So here they are, they're sent to arrest him, and this man says that he's going to go on his terms. And he's not just going to go elsewhere, but he's going to go to him who sent him. Who is he talking about? He's in complete control here. He's not terrified by these guards at all. Who is this man? Then they saw him stand up amongst the great multitude and cry out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now the temple guard here, they're not, they're not a bunch of thugs. The temple guard is made up of Levites. These are religiously devout men. These are men who know the scriptures. They know the scriptures that speak of God's salvation being depicted as living water. They probably understood that Jesus is saying that the Feast of Booths is fulfilled in himself. They see him proclaiming this to his enemies. He's proclaiming it to people that have rejected him throughout this whole feast as he's been preaching. He's proclaiming it to his would-be captors. Jesus perhaps looks directly right at the temple guard as he's proclaiming this and says, if anyone thirsts, and they're amazed at the authority that this man has by the, uh, the majesty, by the love that he has. He's proclaiming this to his enemies. And they've never seen anything like this before. And they say, no one's ever spoke like this man. They go out to him as authorities to arrest him, but what they find is that he is the one with all the authority. Brothers and sisters, behold the awesome authority of our Lord and Savior. He is the Son of God who declares the very words of God. He speaks with all the authority of God. Five months later, from our passage here, five months later, when our Lord is arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane, we read in John chapter 18, that the soldiers go to arrest him. And as they go to arrest him, Jesus steps forward, it says. He's not running away. He's not cowering. He steps forward to meet his captors. And he says, whom do you seek? <laughs> and they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, ego a me. I am. And their response is, they fall back on the ground. He speaks with the authority of God. He declares that he is God himself, that he is Yahweh. No one has ever spoken like this man. And yet, while they're amazed at Christ, these soldiers are amazed at Christ in John chapter 7, they do not repent and they do not give him the honor that is due his name. They do not follow Jesus. They go back to the Sanhedrin. Brothers and sisters, it is not enough merely to admire Jesus' words to stand in awe of his person or his works, or even to tremble at his majesty. The soldiers did all of this, and yet they remain opposed to Christ and refuse to follow him. Remember back when I was in graduate school, the church that I went to, the pastor there, he was preaching, and, and he said that someone had reached out to him that said that he really appreciated his preaching, and that he appreciated hearing these all about Jesus. The, my pastor at the time was going through John as well. And hearing all about the majesty of Jesus and the authority of Jesus and the glory of Jesus. But as our, my pastor had talked talk to this man, he had no interest in actually turning to Jesus. He was just really impressed with Jesus. May that never be said of us. Where we are impressed with Jesus, we stand in awe of Jesus, we are amazed at the authority of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, but we never actually turn to Jesus. True faith doesn't remain a spectator of Christ. It turns from sin, it turns to Christ, and receives him for who he is. So that's the fourth group. Group. Here's the fifth group. They have a blind hatred of Jesus. This last group is the religious leaders, and they're the ones that are the most opposed to Christ. They want to arrest Christ, and they want to kill Christ. And they are blinded from Christ, from their pride and from their malice. We see their pride in verses 47 through 49. So they rebuke the officers when they come back empty-handed. And they say, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. So they say, 
the only ones who believe in Christ are those who are deceived. No important people like the Pharisees or the authorities have believed in him. Now, there are some authorities that do believe in Christ. We'll read about that in John chapter 11. There are some Pharisees that will believe in Christ. Uh, Nicodemus, we read about him in a little bit here. He will come to a saving faith in Christ. Joseph of Arimathea, another Pharisee, did come to a saving faith in Christ. And then there's a very well-known Pharisee that came to a saving faith in Christ. And who's that? The Apostle Paul. So there are some authorities. There are some uh, religious leaders that did come to saving faith in Christ. But for the most part, they did reject Christ. They did reject Christ. And so they're saying, no one of any significance has followed Christ. It's only this crowd who doesn't know the law who follows Christ. Listen to their disdain for their fellow Jews, this uneducated crowd. It's their own pride here that keeps them from Christ. D.A. Carson writes, the religious authorities boast that they have not been duped, but their very boasting is precisely what has duped them. They're not able to learn self-denial or that they are sinners and that they, and that they need their sin to be atoned for. And so their pride blinds them from Christ. Now, Nicodemus is not yet a follower of Christ, but he sees his, their, the unrestrained hatred of his fellow compatriots there in the Sanhedrin. They're seeking to arrest Jesus and to kill him without even giving him a fair trial. And so he asks in verse 51, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? The law demanded that anyone would receive a fair hearing. That, that that person would have an opportunity to defend his teaching. And Jesus has not had that opportunity to defend his teaching. They're rushing to judgment. They're rushing to arrest him. They're rushing to kill him. Well, how do they respond to Nicodemus's very valid question? They mock him. They mock Nicodemus. Verse 52 says, they replied, are you from Galilee too? They're insulting him which reveals they don't care about the law. They don't care about the law. They said that the people, the crowd doesn't know the law, but here we see that they are the ones who don't want to follow the law. And then they say in verse 52, search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. They don't know who, they don't know that Jesus is from Bethlehem, but even the statement here, it's not true. They're blinded by their malice towards Jesus. There were other prophets that arose from Galilee. Jonah, in the Old Testament, he arose from Galilee. And Nahum, he also arose from Galilee. But they just make this blanket statement that's not even true. They're set on only one thing, and that is killing Jesus. They hate Jesus, and they want him done away with. The book of Proverbs, it, it describes those that despise wisdom as fools. They're fools. The fools despise wisdom, and they despise instruction. But amongst those that are fools... The most hopeless of all those that are fools are those who are mockers or sometimes called scoffers. They're, they're filled with arrogant pride. And one of the distinguishing mar marks of a scoffer is that they won't be corrected. In Proverbs 9, 7, it says, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And whoever reproves a wicked man incurs injury. And that's who these Pharisees are. They're scoffers. They're mockers. They're puffed up with pride. Here they are corrected by Nicodemus saying, we need to follow the law here. And they turn on him and attack him. They're completely blinded on. They're, 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 they're the blinders of their own malice and hatred towards Jesus. So all of these responses arise from Jesus' proclamation of the gospel. All five of these responses. The gospel divides. It brings division. But what can these responses teach us about following Christ? Let me, let me give to you two things. The first is this. You must have a, a right heart as you follow Christ. You must have a right heart as you follow Christ. Sin blinds us to Christ. It blinds us to seeing who Christ is. And we've seen this throughout this passage with these different groups. Sin blinds people to Christ. The laziness and prejudice of the crowds 
blinded them. The fear of man of the soldiers blinded them. And the malice and pride of the Pharisees blinded them. We must have a right attitude as we follow Christ. So brothers and sisters, what is your attitude as you're following Christ? Do you intentionally humble yourself before Christ? Do you humble yourself in reading his word or worshiping him with the saints? If not, then you are in danger of your sin and keeping you from seeing who Christ is. And what we need as we are following Christ is we need an attitude of humility and one of earnestness. We need humility. We need humility because Jesus Christ is Lord. We must humble ourselves before him. We must realize that he has the words of eternal life. We must realize that he is God and that we are not, that he stands in judgment over us and we don't stand in judgment over him. We must realize that he is our master and that we are called to obey him. And we also need an attitude of earnestness. We must not be lazy like the crowd and fail to earnestly seek him. Jesus calls us. He, he says, follow me. That's what he calls us. Follow me. So we are called to do what he has told us to do. We live our lives according to his word. We live our lives in light of his finished work on the cross. So do you have the attitude of intentionally following Christ? Not coasting, not just going on with life, but do you have the attitude of intentionally following Christ? This is what he calls of us. Pursue him. Follow him. An attitude of humility and one of earnestness. And, and secondly, this passage teaches us that you must be willing to follow Christ alone. You must be willing to follow Christ alone. What I mean by that is not, uh, not be a lone ranger and to not be uh, connected with the local church, other believers, but um, you must be willing to follow Christ without the support from family or friends. Of the five groups that John lists here, only one of these groups has a true confession of faith. And that means that there is division from these other four groups with those who said, this is the Christ. And that division, that almost certainly ran down um, friends and family members and brothers and sisters and fathers and sons and mothers and daughters. And that teaches us <clears throat> that we must be willing to follow Christ alone. And this is how it often is. Oftentimes, we are like the, the character Christian in John Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress. He hears the gospel, but everyone in the city of destruction, his neighbors, his friends, his wife, and his children, they're all trying to keep him from following Christ. They try to convince him it's foolishness, that he needs to reject it. His wife and his children are weeping and pleading with him. Don't, don't pursue this. Don't go to the celestial city. Don't follow Christ. Stay here in the city of destruction. But what does Christian do? He puts his fingers in his ears, and he runs toward the light of the celestial city, and he says, life, life, eternal life. That's what Christ calls of us. We set our eyes upon Jesus Christ. Even if there's division from among those that we love dearly, we say, we're fixing our eyes upon Jesus, and we're following him. Even if we go alone, we'll follow Christ. Sadly, we often can't journey with our loved ones. The gospel brings division. It's brought division in my family, amongst my siblings. It's brought division in Ashley's family with her siblings. I'm sure it's brought division in your family as well, with your children or your parents or your cousins or whomever. The gospel brings division. Jesus brings division in a household between husband and wife, father and son, mother and daughter. But we must love Christ more than we love the acceptance of our loved ones. Jesus says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So if you would follow Christ, live a life of obedience to Christ, faithfully speak the, speak the words of Christ, then be prepared that the greatest opposition will often come from within your own family. Some relatives may try to keep you from following Christ. They mock you for your faith in Christ or even hate you 
for your trust in Christ. Brothers and sisters, be ready for this. Be prepared for this. Christ calls you, pick up your cross and follow me. Follow me. And brothers and sisters, Jesus is worth it. Amen? Jesus is worth it. Jesus says, if you try to keep your life, he says at the end of Matthew 10 there in that passage that Bob read, if you try to keep your life, you try to preserve it, then you're going to lose it. But he says, if you lose your life for my sake, then you will gain it. So Christ is worth it. He is worth it. Let's pray. Father, we, we so wish that the gospel did not bring division. And there's nothing wrong with the gospel. The fault is not in the gospel. The fault is in the heart of sinful man. Well, we do see that that is what Christ has ordained, that the gospel does bring division. And so, Father, our prayer is strengthen us. We're so weak. It's so easy to be tempted by what others say, by the opinion of others by the approval of others. But Father, I pray that we would set our eyes on our Lord and Savior and that we would faithfully follow him. That we would love the approval that comes from you more than the approval that comes from man. Father, I'm sure there are, there are many amongst us who, this is tough. This is, a, this is a tough truth because there is painful division in their family. And Father, I pray my prayer for them is twofold. My, my prayer, Father, is that you would strengthen them, that you'd strengthen them in their faith. That you'd help them to set their eyes upon Christ. And Father, I pray that you would give them joy as they do so, that they would know that Jesus is worth it. He is worth it. So be with us, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen.